All right, we're doing the more of the kitty game. Perfect date. Let's be one of the girls this time. We'll be, uh, yeah, Maureen. Maureen's a good name. <clears throat> Chapter 3. It was a long boat journey. My legs are a bit wobbly and I mean, oh no, they changed a little bit. Blue jetty. Actually, they just got, they just skipped to the, the jetty part. City guards come to collect me. ID. Rummage about. Da -da -da -da. Show them my ID. Maureen. <coughs> Meow. Come on in, follow me. Alright, let's follow Egon Spangler. We walked quite a pace to keep up with. We're not the social type, so we trekked along in silence until we're at the camp outside a large tent. He's waiting for you in here. Glad to have you on board, Maureen. Shall we go through a few formalities? Blah, blah, blah. We're gonna gonna sounds good to me sir first we have so okay now I get to choose a drink you know what um, water tea we did tea last we did whiskey the first time this time we'll do water of course do you have any water there are natural springs on the island, and we have the bottled kind, too. Bottled well, water would be great. I'm not too keen on to start drinking from natural water sources until I'm sure they're not being used by cat as uh, cat urinals. Yeah, it makes sense. We spend the next hour getting through the kit. We teach us about the catalog. Uh, we meet some of the local cats and learn to scan with it. A lot of fun. Finally, I'm showing my tent. Oh, here we go. We're getting it. While I'm unpacking, I find something very interesting under my bed. It's the personal journal of the previous research assistants. The one before me. Uh, I've been discovered a lot going on and I was told about. It's hard to believe this stuff is true. Maybe the last researcher was prone to flights of fancy. Still makes great bedtime story material and I stay up reading and my eyelids begin to close. In spite of my best efforts, I drift to deep sleep. Wait till the start, I can hear rustling in paper in the tent. A cat's got something in its mouth. It's the journal, of course. Wait! I run off into the night. Same shit. Ch I'm chasing the cat. Full speed in the forest. I must get the book back. Everything I know is in it. Same shit. I start to feel woozy. I realize it's too late that I'm straight into the danger zone. I'm going to be sick. My eyes. I close my eyes tight and drop to my knees. Eyes open a calico cat standing in front of me. Drops journal and finish my I pass out. Too late. I am fucked. Uh, we got our six cat oh, just five? Where's the Where's my original kitty? The one that, that I played that turned into a cat. Hello, can you hear me? Are you okay? Here we go again. Move back a bit. Let them breathe. Has it been bitten? Big's cat is standing over me, staring at me. Yes, definitely bitten. Look at his hand. Bring a hand on my face. Blue vision. I make out several deep scratches. Same shit as before. Cats watch me intently. Is this real? I saw something in the journal about kidnapping. Catnapping. Yeah. We're sorry. It was the only way. My head's begun to clear. I realize that if I can talk to these cats, not only is it true, but it's already too late. I have the sickness. We need to have a talk, human. No, we don't. I already know what's going on. I've got the sickness. That's why I can, I can hear you. What happens now? It depends on you, human. Are you going to help us or not? Yeah, they just it skipped all of that this time. I'm gonna help the kitties. Well, of course I am. You need my help, and I need yours if I'm gonna find an antidote. 
Spoken like a true champion. Oh, let's hope this third let's hope it's third time lucky. Should be more than likely. Fortunately, the last one didn't get very far with discovering what happened to our friends. They didn't make an antidote either. No, but we got we got we they did something and he died. He got shot. I think with our notes to build on, I'm going to crack this. Well, I promise to give it my best uh, my best shot at least. Hooray! Respect. Jolly good ship. Catalog's beeping. I now have to get to work. I'm just about to enter my la the lab with, to begin my legitimate work when a catalog beeps. A message without a contact. Oh god, can I read it this time? I lose the what? I couldn't read that! Journal, but I was so sleepy last night I don't recall what it was. I decided to ignore a mystery messenger for now. I'd be late for work. I was. Oh, it's getting so annoying that I can't read that. The professor's always working, already working when I arrive, but I'm not late. So there's no fuss. I get through the day efficiently and head back to tent. Uh, work is done. I want to get, grip, get to grips with finding out what all I can as soon as possible. Intercepting mail. I can't stop thinking about those important fragrant pink letters Zane mentioned. Let's check it out. Run through the sequence one more time. I know it by heart, but I'm nervous. I've been watching long enough to be sure that the routine is just like clockwork. No deviation, well, apart from one, and I've made that work for me. When the boat arrives in 1300 hours, Zane, always alone, Talks to the older man, Bob, who hands over the post, while the younger of the two, Joe, leads up the dolly with well, loads up the dolly with boxes and some supplies. Zane puts the envelope puts the envelopes, never more than three, into his breast the breast pocket of his jacket. That solves the mystery of why he is always always overdresses whenever the boat comes in. He then wheels the dolly to the mess tent and unloads the food supplies then to the lab and unloads the medical supplies then to the storage hut where he unloads the remaining packages and leaves the dolly next he goes to professor popper's tent if the professor is in he hands over two of the envelopes keeping the third his puzzler in his jacket pocket if however the professor isn't in the tent zane makes his way back to his chair on the dock, drapes his jacket over the back of it, and spends the afternoon on the, his puzzles before going back in the evening to deliver the professor's mail. He never lets the envelopes out of his ja jacket pocket or the jacket out of his sight, so my only opportunity would be to pickpocket the security guard when he takes his jacket off. But that relies on Professor Popper not being in his tent. Lucky I've ensured, with the help of my feline friends, that the pop that the professor will be held up during his out of grounds inspection. Yeah, 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 yeah. Usually Popper just meanders around the inner perimeter of the base camp area and checks that all is well. Most days everything is, but today. Kibbles and Trixie have staged a little rumpus that will engage him for just enough time to miss Zane's delivery. He is, of course, sat in his usual place, jacket draped over his chair. Hi there, Zane. 127. I suppose we're on first name terms now. A little something for you. Zane frowns, but does not look at me. His eyes are instead where they always are, on his crossword. I made you a puzzle. His eye, he eyes me skeptically. A crossword, to be exact. It's pretty tricky, if I do say so myself. I created the puzzle using all the cat's general, general knowledge. Major and Murphy thought of some particularly treacherous treasures while Kibble and Trixie 
Kibbles and Trixie offered some great obscure pop culture questions. Snooty Booty was most just mostly just trying to get cat treats out of my pocket. Of course. I hand the paper to Zane, who's still frowning. This dick's having a whale of a time. What? Is this a joke? Oh, it gets harder. Zane peers over the crossword. Why did you make this for me? Well, you know how bored I get, and I like you, Zane. Zane breaks into his first smile I've seen on his face, although small and slightly uncomfortable looking. I don't have anything for you. Yes, he's warming up to me. This plan is going spiffingly. Oh, don't worry about that. All I want is for you to complete it. I make my hands into a heart shape. While Zane is distracted, I feel stupid, but Murphy insisted that would be my signal for him to strike. <laughs> and sure enough, along he slinks, cool as anything. He winds his feline body between Zane's le legs and notice Zane's tongue is now sticking out and her shoulders are hinged, hunched in concentration. You stuck already? I dart a look at Murphy to get ready to make his move. He throws me a disconcer disconcerting wink. Okay. It's not that hard. Just one about the archetypical counterpart to Yandy Ray. Oh yes, that's quite niche. Thanks for that one, Kibbles. While I engage Zane, I can see that Murphy has already reached up as though stretching against the chair and nudged his nose inside to the inside breast pocket of the jacket. Oh, sh oh shoot! Get out of here! See Murphy scamper off and my heart sinks. Anyway, I'll check back later. See how you're getting on with it. Zane grunts in response. I walk back dejectedly to where McMurphy and I had agreed to meet after the mission was over. And suddenly my spirits lift at the sight of a little pink corner peeking out from under the designated rock. Murphy, you're a star. There's no end to my talents. I snatch up the envelope, say goodbye to McMurphy, and head to the privacy of my tent. I examine my trophy while the kettle boils. I touch the pretty pink envelope. I I'm touched by the pretty pink envelope and delicate fragrance, and feel suddenly embarrassed. Am I trying the professor's love life? What has gotten into me? Getting notions of secret games on and subterfuge? Oh, goings on in subterfuge. Yeah. I'm about to put the letter back when I'm over overwhelmed by curiosity. I wonder who the professor's secret love could be. Why are they like? What are they like? Woman? Man? Other? Before I can contain myself, I have steamed open the flap and I'm peeking inside. It's not at all what I expect, and my previous suspicions come flooding back. This paper is in. Dark contrast to the pretty pink wrapping. It is a typed message on white paper. Personal. I have been informed of your latest subject. I would rather hear about such things. I would rather hear about such things from you personally. It would not be wise to take my silence for authorization. Please keep this in mind for future transactions. I will let this indiscretion slide, but if it is ever repeated, I will have no choice but to deal with you the way I dealt with 124. As for the project, case study number six is as centric yeah, as I can't do okay. Please act accordingly. PI or P103 has been unsuccessful. Avoid any further investigation. Lab 09 has received the newest batch protocol to begin on the 8th. Finally, I trust your new assistant has arrived and has proven to be more hopeful than the previous one. You seem to have a run of bad luck with that particular area. As you know, I do not abide bad luck and will expect a reversal of fortune post-haste. With 
equally yours. Seven. Of nine? shipment of supplies delivered and I have to help get it all unloaded. Maybe I can get some. Okay. Let's do it. I've been asked to help with the uh, loading and unloading of supplies today. This suits me because I've been itching for a chance of talking to the Freeman and his son. I'm curious to see if they have any useful bits of info that might help me in my quest to find out the real story of the silent. It only comes once a week, and every other weekend. The weekend deliveries are all the good things. Food, mail, treats, etc. And the mood is always lightened. These midweek trips, on the other hand, are strictly work-related and tend to be very early morning, very early morning when we're all a bit grumpy. Or late night when we're all overtired. Today is just... It's so early that the light has only just broken. Zane and I are waiting down at the jetty. They're late. Really? It's only five minutes. Bob's never late. This must be quite the long trip, though. To the mainland? You'd expect at least five, maybe ten minutes either way. Bob's never late. I remember that Zane isn't one for chit-chat, so I keep quiet and wait. Thankfully... It isn't long I can hear the sound of the boat's engine before I can see it, since the morning mist hasn't been burned off by the sun yet. Zane straightens up, and suddenly they're here, emerging from the mist like a ghost ship. Pling! There it is! They've been doing this so long that it only takes them minutes to dock and tie off before we're stepping aboard. Right. Right. Another man, another man a few words. Not Bob's son, Joe. He nods back. I guess we're, um, I guess we're the same age. But he's huge. Problems? A few extra crates. Hold us up five minutes. Okay. Me and Bob will do the shifting. You two do the stacking until that. Until we come back with the outgoing. You stay aboard and sort out the incoming. Got that, Brainy? You're looking at me, Brainy? totally excited that Zane has given me a nickname, but a little crushed that the nickname is Brainy. Sure, you bring him, we fling him. I see that I'm the only one grinning like a fool. Joe knows what to do. You do as you're told. They're gone before I can say anything else. Joe has already started loading up the dolly with incoming crates. He's clearly an old hand at this. You look like you've been doing this your whole life. Family business? Move those crates there. They need to go off next. I just overstepped my question, but I'm not sure if it's deliberate, so I try a different tack. You don't go to college then, Joe? Nope. I'm not getting anywhere with this, so I changed something less per changed something less personal. Ben said you're never late, which is pretty impressive considering how far you have to come. This is like pulling teeth. How far is it exactly? Quite far. Oh really? And do you stop anywhere else en route? Or are we the only drop-off? Suddenly Joe stopped what he's doing and standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with me. Locked onto my eyes so that I can't look away. Awkward. You got a lot of questions in here. Uh, my suggestion would be keep them there on the inside. Don't do no good poking your nose into other people's business. I'm shocked by his bluntness. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I was just making small talk. You live with them cats. Learn from them. Heart beats faster. I think he's gonna tell me something. What? All cats know curiosity kills them. He starts to laugh out loud. I just stand with my mouth open. I'm not sure how to respond. What's the matter? Cat, cat got your tongue? That's even harder. I'm feeling creeped out and I'm really relieved 
and I'm really relieved to hear the two older men returning. Everything all right here? They have the crates to be loaded onto the boat. What's up with you, Brainy? You look a bit wobbly. Not got your sea legs yet? We were playing cat and mouse, Dad. Bob turns sharply to the sun and shuts him up with a look. You don't want to mind him. He just, he, he don't mean no harm. Let's take what he says with a pinch of salt. I see a look pass between him and Zane, and I get a feeling there's a lot more going on here than I understand. You need to get back now, Brainy. We can take it from here. I won't ask to stay given another chance, but all three men are looking at me, and I just turn and slink away. I know when I'm not one. Who are we going to romance? Let's figure this out. What kitty cat shall we run? McMurphy or Trixie? Let's do McMurphy. Kara, right, wake up. Hmm? Mommy? Is that you? Shh, quiet. Kara, come with me. I have something to show you, but you have to be quiet. Murphy? Yes, it's me. But it's the middle of the night. Ah, Kari, you... now you're not scared, are you? Why would I be scared? Are you being around in the forest in the middle of the night? Don't worry, Kara. I'll be there to protect you. Murphy, you know very well that there's a force field around the island stopping anything from the outside getting in. It makes me it's a pretty safe place, well, except for turning into a cat and being bit by other cats and not going going to the part of the island. It's the danger zone. I mean, would you call that safe? Indeed. So the only thing you have to worry about are the things that are already here. He lures at me with a mock snarl. Seriously, Murph, if, if you're the worst threat here, then this is the safest place on Earth. Come on, Kara. What are you waiting for? Meow, 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 meow. Follow the scraggly cat in the forest. The ground is wet and muddy, and I lose my footing a couple of times, but McMurphy is too determined to notice. Suddenly, he stops dead in his tracks. Here we are. Um, where is here, McMurphy? He ignores my questions, starts digging in some mud, and leaves on the ground. Almost got it. Use a hand, Kara, if you don't mind. Get these leaves out of the way. That's it. Here we are. Okay. Keep digging until there's a fairly deep hole in the ground. My arms and night clothes are covered in mud and leaves, and McMurphy looks like a bog monster in the darkness. Ta da! Ta da! Can't you see it, Kara? Uh, I'm not sure what I'm looking at. I always forget how useless human eyes are in the dark. Just reach into the hole and take out whatever you find. I reluctantly reach into the burrow and find something hard and cold against my hand. I wrap my fingers around it and pull it out. I know the shape, but my eyes can hardly process it. it it's a bottle? There's a lot of bottles and like notes in this game. That's right, Kara. This is my secret stash. No one knows about it. Not a soul, but I thought I'd share it with you. Though we could have kind of a welcome to the island party for two. Secret stash? Is this booze? Nick Murphy lets out a wild laugh. That it is, Kara! You drink alcohol? But you're a cat! That can't be good for your body! Ah, it's not good for any bodies. But it does a wonder for the soul, to be sure. That's why it's called spirits! Ha ha! Well, I suppose you're right there, McMurphy. I guess one little nip couldn't hurt. That's the spirit. I try in vain to get some of the mud off the off of me before giving up and sitting down against a tree. A sodden McMurphy, a sodden McMurphy curls up in my lap. It takes a while to uncork the bottle. McMurphy keeps telling me to smash it open and that the shards of glass will only add to the flavor, but eventually I, su I succeed my way. I pour a little out from McMurphy into a leaf, and I self-consciously swig from the bottle, feeling a, a touch uncivilized. 
Uh, McMurphy, what in heaven's name is this? Ah, now, don't worry about that, Kara. It's not about the taste, it's about the company. I hardly think I'm the type of person you usually hang around with. Well, I usually hang around with cats. And they're not exactly what you'd call my type. I respond by widening my eyes and take another swig from the bottle. Somehow it tastes less terrible than the sec the tastes less terrible the second time around. I find humans much more interesting. They usually have a lot to say. President Company accepted. Murphy winks at me with huge green eyes, and I blush, trying desperately not to show how boring I feel compared to him. Don't take it harsh. I'm only joking. Murphy, I've been meaning to ask you something for a while now. Anything, all right? Ask away. I'd love for us to get to know each other a little better. Is this Sar Kara thing? You, you know, my name is... The rest of the sentence is drowned out by Murphy's howl of laughter. You know me, laugh. Kara, you really do. Huh. That's a weird sentence. I know exactly what your name is, Maureen. Kara, I just say... I just, uh... It's like a pet name, you know? Car means friend, buddy, amigo. It's something my mammy used to call people when I, and I guess just stuck. It's one of the few things I remember about her, actually, that and her beautiful smile. Hey, flash me your pearly whites. I smell like a Murphy awkwardly. He busts into a fiddle after again. Ah, that's a, that's a lovely smile to be sure, but you need to grow into it yet. Uh, could I have a top-up over here? Uh, I don't know if I feel comfortable giving you more alcohol, McMurphy. I think you've had more than enough, in fact. I didn't even want to give you any in the first place. Did you not know that cats have nine lives? And you want to waste all of them on booze? Why not? Besides, the night's still young, and we've only just begun our conversation. Come on, Kara. We have a lot of chin-wiggling to do yet. Are you going to pour or not? We're gonna pour. Let's, let's, uh, just be, let's, yeah, have some booze, kitty cat. Part of me thinks I ought to be a responsible human cut off your alcohol supply, but... But... I believe in true democracy. Care to expand on that and perhaps pour the drinks as you do? The true democratic principle that no, the none shall have power over the people, cats, whatever. How inspirational! I'll toast to that. Right, Murphy. Put on your head. Be it. For with the rejection of authority comes the responsibility of bearing the consequences of your actions. I pour some more of the suspect liquor in Murphy's soggy leaf. Slaint? I don't know how things work in cat protocol, but in human terms, you are very mature. No, wait. Very grown up. Uh, adult? Oh, fiddlesticks. You're over a certain age, and as such, can take responsibility for your own choices. I like it. Spoken like a true libertine. 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 Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I can shake my tail when I feel the vibe. I can't believe I just said that. This stuff is stronger than it looks. My proverbial hat is off to you. I feel disproportionately pleased that Murph has paid me a compliment. Say, Kara, have you ever been in love? He's drunk. Murphy, that second leaf has gone straight to your head. The cat smiles slyly. Sly, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to take that as a yes. Are you still with him? Well, I never technically... I was never technically with them to begin with. Ouch. Well, it's definitely their loss. Oh, I don't think so, McMurphy. We never actually met. Uh, you're not saying you're one of those uh, internet stalker types, are you? Them catfish that Kibbles tells me tells tale of? No, McMurphy. Gosh. It was Bowie, okay? I was in love with David Bowie, you know? <laughs> oh, I feel that. McMurphy frowns and shakes his furry head. See these eyes so green? I can stare for a thousand years, you know? 
Ah, that's a charming song, but I'm afraid I have no idea what's going on anymore. Oh, come on, McMurphy. Everyone knows David Bo who David Bowie is. Red hair, lots of makeup, one blue eye, one brown eye. Well, I did know one sweet soul with a blue eye and one brown eye, but I can assure you they wouldn't be caught dead in makeup. McMurphy snorts. Oh, we're all, well, see, now she's drunk. Everyone's drunk. Everyone's drunk now. Well, what about you, McMurphy? Who's the love of your life? Don't have one, Kara. Never have, never will. I'm a lone wolf. I'm a free agent. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big old yeti out in the mountains, all hairy and smelly and alone. For some reason, I find that very hard to believe, Mr. <gasps> Mick Murphy. Fine, you're right. I'm a fool, a lovesick fool. I've had my heart broken more than once, Hara. And each time hurt more than the last, I tell ya. The thing is, though, Hara, I can't remember a thing about any of them. Any of what? I don't know. <laughs> what were we talking about? David Bowie? Oh, that's right. So tell me how you two met. McMiffy, I think I'm drunk. <clears throat> what the hell have we been drinking? Oh, leave me alone. I haven't touched a drop. Um, I think I'm gonna vomp. I wake up in the forest with a half-empty bottle in my hand, and Murphy is nowhere to be seen. How the hell did I get here? I can't remember a thing. I look at my catalog. Oh, is that really the time? Crikey, I need to get to work. Today's a rest day, though. Your waves crashing. It sounds so loud, I can't. I, I can't make myself be heard, but I still scream to the life craft that is moving away from a sinking ship. Oh, you're dreaming. I'm going down with the ship. I'm being thrashed against the side of the wooden vessel. This isn't right. The ship looks wrong. Ugh. What the fuck? The cat's face looms close to mine. Everything is wrong. All of it. <laughs> Which cat are you? The words come out in my mouth as mewling. And I realize I'm not myself. I'm some kind of beast. Suddenly I'm flying in the... I'm in the claws of some enormous bird. The beating wings are deafening. I look down at the ground approaching the really fast. You can drop through the break. What does that mean? What break? What break? Breakfast, rise and shine. Oh, that was weird. Let's do some more romance. Sorry, Trixie. Sweltering in the mess tent. Typical for me not uh, to get cook duty with the hottest on the hottest day so far. I step out for a moment and try to catch some air. Not sure if I really heard something or if the dehydrating is dehydration is getting to me. Take a swig from my water bottle. Hey, aren't you gonna s share, Carl? Oh, McMurphy. That was. You sting? What are you suggesting, Kara? I only use designated litter areas. Murph, you are incorrigible. You know exactly what I mean. Come on, Kara. Never mind all that. We have work to do. I am working. I'm supposed to be cooking for this evening. I mean, work of the adventuring variety. Oh, of course you do. Ah, come on. Don't be such a bore. I'm sorry, McMurphy, but I can't. I'm very busy here. It's going to take hours to defrost and braise this meat from the, from the mainland. Oh, the meat from the mainland. Well, if you come with me, you may end up proving a much tastier dish in half the time. What do you say, Kara? You up for the... Brack? Uh, 
are you saying? You mean I should just bunk off? That's the spirit. Strip off your apron and let's hit the trail. But I, I can't just... What if someone comes looking for me? Leave him a note. Gone fishing. Maybe it's the heat, but I'm overcome with mo a moment of madness. Well, okay then. You wild Irish rover, I'm all yours. Ah, now, that, now there's a thought. Oh, he's being a perv. Bad kitty. Before I can answer, he's slunk into, into the thickening of the forest behind the clay cooking pits. I whip off my apron and follow behind. Wait, Murph, it's too hot to run. And we really ought to cool ourselves off, huh? He led me up the cliffs and without warning takes a running jump off the edge. I see him flying through the air and watch mesmerized as he cuts through the water. Oh no, Murphy, are you okay? Don't panic, I'm coming! I kick off my flip-flops and shorts and follow him in the water. I'm surprised at how shallow it is and that I'm easily able to stand. Murph, where are you? I frantically search about, fearing, that, fearing for his safety, and suddenly feel something brushing against my legs, making me scream out loud. What? What? What's that? I look down in the clear water and see Murphy spread, uh, speeding along the seabed like a shark, fast and sleek, and suddenly breaking up through the surface with something in his mouth. Murphy, you can swim? What on earth is that thing? Oh my, it's a fish! A fish! I can see he's smiling, even with a sprat, even with a sprat in the way. You can fish? Spits the fish back into the water. There's truly no end to my talents, Carl. You can say that again, but, but, I have so many questions, I don't even know where to start. Catch your breath, Kara. I know I'm exhilarating company, but you need to exercise a little bit of restraint, or you'll be swooning on me next. Relax. The salt water is very buoyant. Copy with Murphy, and we both lie on our backs on the surface. It's very calming and tranquil, and I'm finally able to collect my thoughts. I realize I have not had this much clarity in a long time. This is so cool. I know. Trixie took me here first. Calls it the Ponder Pool. Oh, you can all swim then? I thought cats... Before I can finish my sentence, McMurphy cuts in. It's a common misconception that cats can't swim. As you can see, it's another thing we excel at. So humble too. As Nana McMurphy used to say, if you got a trumpet, blow it. What about the fish? Where did they come from? There's no birds or fish on this island. It's one of the first things they tell you in orientation. That's because they don't know. They don't know what? Ah, it's better if I just show you. Come on, Carl, follow me. We swim for a while and you remember McMurphy leading the way with purpose. And then it's then he stops. Well, notice anything interesting? Well, the water is much cooler and deeper. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Can you feel anything? I stand perfectly still for a moment and feel a strange sensation around my legs. Like a swarm, like a warm tickling under the water. Trickling, trickling under the water. Hey, Murphy, are you peeing? Don't be so rude, Kara. It's the current. Look over there. Are you focused my eyes until I see that what I thought was a rock shadow is moving. It comes closer into focus. And I realize it's a shoal of small fish darting in and out of a particular spot. What is that? I don't understand what I'm looking at. Isn't it enough just to see, Kara? To experience? Do you always have to understand everything? Well, yes, that's my job. I, it's who I am, Murphy. I'm a scientist. It's in my DNA. I seek to understand. Come on then, scientist. Let's take a closer look. Move closer to the area where the fish are gathered. I put my hand down and realize I can touch them even and even pick them up. But something is stopping them from swimming further inland. 
Hey Murphy, we need to get going. I'm going to be in big trouble if I'm away for any longer. But thank you for showing me this. I'm definitely going to come back and try and come back here and try to understand it. Why don't you just take some fish? I wouldn't waste your time, Kara. It wouldn't be a waste. I've committed to finding out all I he cuts across he cuts across me as I'm speaking. I meant coming back to this particular spot. The fishes won't be here. Oh, I see. It's only a certain time at certain times? And different locations. It changes all the time. There's no pattern to it either. You so you just be sneaking pins sticking pins in maps, Kara. I brought you here because I saw them this morning. Chances are they'll be gone by this afternoon. Disappointment must be apparent on my face because the Murphy switches lanes super fast to distract it. Okay, Kara. It's time to strip off. Huh? The t-shirt would make a lovely knit. Let's go fishing. Let's do it. I whip off my top and use it as a net to scoop up as many fish as possible. It's quite effective. Great idea, Murph! Now you can rustle up tasty fish supper in no time at all. And yet, and you get to enjoy my company for an extra hour. Win-win, Kara. Okay, so now I have a little challenge for you. That car is music to my ears. There's little I like more than a gauntlet. Thrown. Well, it's hardly a gauntlet, more a brain teaser. How am I going to explain the rest of to the rest of my team this bountiful uh, ocean offering? Why I tell them anything at all? Because they're going to notice that we're eating something that wasn't on uh, the delivery list or the menu wrote it. That tastes way too fresh for something recently defrosted. You worry far too much about things that really don't matter. I know he's right. I can do with loosening up a little, but this is pretty a pretty big this is a big dilemma really. Maybe I thought to tell the Maybe I ought to tell Professor, Professor Popper about this. What's the harm? Nakis stops splashing and looks at squarely in the eyes. There would be harm, Kara. Trust me on that. Obviously, I don't mean I'd tell him about you or anything that would endanger any of us. Just that I noticed the shoal and the fishes, <laughs> the shoal of fishes, and I took some, and I took some, and if you really think you could mention a phenomenon like that and that would be the end of it? That he wouldn't start putting all manner of investigations and disruptions in place? You are touchingly naive, my friend. I feel myself blush. I'm a bit naive, but I don't like the thought of lying. So what do you suggest then? If you know so much about everything, give me a plausible story and I'll follow through. Murphy lets out a wild howl and splashes water at me. Now that's what I like to hear. You impetuous daredevil. I splash him back. And furious water fight ensues. We're making such a ruckus that I'm amazed that no one comes to check on what's going on. After a good ten minutes of laughter and play, we run out of steam and float in the buoyant warm water. Let's hear it then, Oz. What's my cover story? It's, very, it's a very simple case of brazen bluffing. Okay. Make a simple but a delicious meal. And if anyone should ask where the fish came from, shrug your shoulders and ask the same question. Huh? It's all in the poker face. You remain completely impassive and ask the same question. Yeah, I wondered that too. Where did the fish come from? They're delicious. Really? Trust me, Kara, as a cat who is forever risking one of his nine, the, simp the simpler you keep it, the more they'll buy it. But if they ask you where you got them from, you tell them the fridge. Simple. I feel quite giddy at this prospect of getting away with the ruse. Okay, Murph, let's gather the supper. We have an abundance in no time, and, haul and I haul my catch to the kitchen in good time. To make a tasty meal for everyone and a little extra for my feline pals. Meow, meow, meow. Let's do a thing of research. 
We have one thing of research. Russia has assigned me to work on special. Okay, let's do that. Marine, I have a very important job for you today. It's quite a tricky one, but you've proven yourself to be very capable, and I'm certain you can handle it. Follow me, I have a little lady I'd like you to meet. Professor leads me to the research lab in the forest. But instead of going in, he takes me to the area around the back. This is our brave little nugget, Raven Paul. She has to be isolated over here. Don't you miss it? Professor reaches out of the cage, which is stood on a table, and picks up the tiny black cat that's sleeping inside. Such a good girl, aren't you? We keep her here away from the others because the poor thing is very unwell. Did you see the nasty rash? Mr. Pop rolls out one of the cat's paws. We inspect and it's red and swollen. Raven Paul looks at me with her big, watery eyes. One blue, one brown. Oh! Ha ha! They're probably watering because of the medication she's on. But it makes her look as if she's pleading with me. One blue, one brown. Remember, I remember um, Murphy saying something about that. She doesn't seem to be able to eat without assistance either, poor thing. We've been treating her as the best we can, but I'm not sure if she'll make it. Perhaps not even to the end of the week. This was out a sad sigh. I have my fingers crossed, though. We don't give up on any of these cats, do we, Raven Paul? No, we don't. We're going to try and get you all better. She's such a pretty cat. Her eyes are enchanting, aren't they? They're very pretty. She's a very pretty cat indeed, and she knows it. Reach out to stroke Ravenfall, but she struggles away from my hand. She's a stuck-up kitty. Ah, she's getting cranky. I think we've kept Grumpy Pants here awake long enough. He puts her gently back in the cage and locks it shut. Ravenfall seems to fall asleep instantly. She's a sleepy kitty. I hope I didn't distress her. Of course not, Marine. She's usually very she's usually very wary of humans before she gets to know them. When I first found the poor thing on the beach, she almost scratched my eyes out, in spite of the terrible fragile state she was in. Professor smiles at the memory. He's happy he almost got his eyes scratched out. Makes sense, you know. She's uh, such a little trooper. She was half dead at first. She's gotten a lot better since then. I honestly wouldn't be surprised to see her pull through this. I hope she does. I hope so too, Professor. Quite. Now, the reason I brought you here is because, regret regrettably, I won't be able to see Raven Paul person personally any longer. It's a pity as she's so used to me now. But there's nothing for it. I have been given an extra workload recently. And I need to share out a few of my odd jobs to accommodate it. I thought you would be the ideal person to look after Raven Paw for me. Considering you're probably not going to be on the island much longer. That sucks. I'm taken aback that the professor has trusted me with such responsibility. It's quite flattering until I remember that he doesn't have much choice. Me being the only assistant on the island. Every day she requires a change of dressing, a dose of medication, some cream rubbed onto her rashes, and a syringe full of some nutrient milk. This can be quite distressing for her, so I'd like someone with a nice, with it, with a nice and patient manner to take over for me. Would you be interested, Maureen? Of course, sir. I'd love to help out in any way I can. That's what I'm here for. Oh, splendid! I'm so glad to. I'm so glad. I think you and Raven Paul get along famously before too long. She's such a sweet. She's oh, she has such a sweet nature. I look forward to it, sir. Did you start now? Oh, uh, of course. Tip top. I shall be in the lab. I shall be in the lab if you need me for anything. Please don't be afraid to give me a shout. I'm terribly sorry to burden you with this so suddenly, but I have such a lot of work to do right now. Um, okay, Professor. I feel a little apprehensive as I watch Professor Popper retreat into the lab. I didn't realize I'd be expected to do anything right now without training or anything. Sounds like most of the places I've worked. Of 
Good luck, everyone else. I remember, I remember that this isn't like an ordinary lab back at home. I must try to adapt to the higgly peggly way of things that things are done. What, what weird wording in this? I take a deep breath. Change of dressing? I can do that. Hello, pretty kitty. I'm very sorry, but I have to disturb you. Small cat lets out a sad mew as if as I lift her out of her cage. Aw, I know life is unfair. Now, where are your dressings? I put Raven Paw next to the cage on the table. She lays down compliantly. She obviously knows the routine. She has a large bandage on the side of her ribs. I begin to gently remove it, trying hard not to pull on her skin too much. Well, I suppose if we're going to be doing this every day, we might as well get to know each other, right? So, hello, my name is Maureen. Quite new here. I know your name already, Ravenpaw. Nice name. I bet the professor named you. He certainly knows how to pick them, doesn't he? Cat tenses as I remove the last of the plaster and re reveal a scar on a patch of bare skin where the professor has shaved her for surgery. Oh dear, that scar looks very tender. I should clean it. Is that rude? Is that right, Ravenpaw? Let me look. There are some drawers under the table. I quickly find some antiseptic, gel, and cotton pads. Now, Ravenpaw, I'm going to level with you. This is going to sting a bit, but please don't take it out on me. I'm doing this for your own good, okay? Trust me. You do not want this scar to become infected. That would be disastrous. Cat stays perfectly still while I wipe at the scar. She doesn't even make a sound. I have to say, I'm impressed and a little disquieted. Wow, you are a brave girl, aren't you? Well done. When I was a child, I cut my arm on some thorns and had, had to remove antiseptic put on it. As I remember, I screamed the house down. Carefully put on, I carefully put on the clean bandage, trying hard not to stick it to her fur. I suppose the medication comes next, doesn't it? What do we have here? I look through the drawers and find a box of pre-filled syringes labeled cat, cat a tonic. Oh, I presume you'd be taking tablets. Of course, the professor said you have trouble with solids, don't you? Poor thing. Okay, same thing as last time. Don't shoot the injector. I hold the skin on the back of Ray and Paul's neck tight and go to inject quickly to get it over with, but the syringe is stiff and it takes a lot longer than I expected. Again, the little cat makes no response. It doesn't move a muscle, almost as if she can, can't feel it. Good girl. Gosh, you're so tough. You know, I bet you and McMurphy would get on like a house on fire. I bet that they know each other. They do. He mentioned something like that. Grandpa's ears pick up if she's heard a rattlesnake. Murphy is one of the coolest people. I mean, I was a little wary at first, but he has that Irish charm that's so hard to resist. Tiny Cat's head spins to look up at me. How do you know he's Irish? My heart lurches into my throat. Have you got it? You have, haven't you? You're sick. You've got the sickness. I have a million questions running through my head, but I am unable to speak. Listen to me, human. You must help me. I suddenly jolt to my senses. I am... I am trying to help you, Ravenpaw. Please, don't use that cream on me. It burns. It's given me these red patches. I know it hurts, but I have to rub it in your wounds. Those red patches will get dry and itchy if I don't... And, and even infected otherwise. No, please, I beg you, human. This stuff doesn't help. It doesn't. It hurts. I know it feels that way, but it's helping you, I promise. The professor has been caring for you thoroughly since it, he's found you. I, uh, I'd get the sack if your treatment went downhill now. That man has only ever hurt me. I'm taken aback. The professor cares for you very much and only wants you to get better. The cat turns her face away as if she's given up hope. It pulls my heartstrings and I pause for a moment. We're going to stop the treatment. Okay. I'm taking a big leap here. I'm going to give you five days without this cream. And if 
I see deterioration in your condition, it's back to the strict re uh, regime for you, Missy. No complaints, Neil. Thank you, human. Yay! Uh, let's let's rest. All right. We did the restoration magic. So let's McMurphy it up. It's too beautiful a day to be slaving in a hot lab. So when Murph, when Murph invited me for a little stroll, it was easy to say yes. Not that I need much incentive to spend time with him. He's very engaging company. I found one of my favorite spots where the cliffs sweep upwards above the blue water. Suddenly, without any warning, Murphy plunges over the top of the tower and rocks. I run the cliff's edge with my heart, with my heart in my mouth, to see what's happened. And there's, and there is a sight I still haven't gotten used to. He's in the water, more otter than cat, waving me to follow. Jump, Kara, jump! Sure, sure, the water's grand. Murphy. I'm shocked by the shrillness of my voice. I hadn't intended to be quite such a shriek. I was aiming for stern admonishment. Look at her face. Jesus Christ. That's so dangerous. You could do yourself serious injury or worse from such a height. Oh, peesh. Come on, Kara. Or you won't get to see the little surprise I have in store. You've already surprised me enough for one day. Ha! Huh. Which one of us is meant to be the pussy? <laughs> oh, shit. At this, I am filled with indulgence that takes over my body. And before I know it, I'm halfway between ledge and water bracing for impact. This way! Still catching my breath as a Murphy McMurphy head disappears under the surface. My mind is saying, no, this is ridiculous, get back to land this instant, but my body's following the Irish cat. Oh! Is this what I think it is? My eyes take a moment to adjust, but when they do, I can hardly believe what I'm looking at. It's a ship! We approach from the stern. It looks pretty much intact. I can see the name on the near port side, and though faded and worn in parts, the words are unmistakable. Kitty's desire. Meow. My head is swimming due to the excitement and lack of oxygen. I flounder to the surface to catch my breath. Murphy eventually bobs up to join me on the surface. Surprised? A shipwreck? Here? Yes, this is an old island, Kara. It has a, a lot has happened here. But how did a ship even get here before the path was made? Hey, don't ask me, Kara. I'm just in it for the grog. If Murphy smiles and, dry, and dives back in the murky depths, I follow a flailing flesh bag in comparison to Murphy's sleek figure. I try to get closer, a closer look at the wreckage. But it's a big ship, likely a tra uh, trading vessel, ju judging from the size. It's hard to tell how old it is, but it certainly isn't modern. Maybe 18th, 19th century? We enter the ship from a huge hole in the stern. I realize that a lot of the vessel is actually on land, and it's obvious that it ran ashore after it was damaged at sea. I think this is a ship from, like, the last game that we read about. There's not much time to ponder the mechanics of what happened as Murphy is tugging at my shirt with his paw and right paw, while gesturing with his other paw outstretched to the cabin he wants me to enter. I'm grateful for the air trapped inside and gasp for breath. Here, Carl, look! Hang on, let me catch my... But is he already ducked into the next cell? How is he not out of breath? 
I realize the ability to swim underwater is usually strong, but he barely breaks the surface at all. And here, through the hole, he sounds really excited. And as I enter, I see why. There in the center of the cabin is a chest. It's wedged between the wall and, and a surprisingly well-preserved writing desk. Leaning, preventing it from falling and being buried in the sand. A treasure chest! I sound like a giddy child and feel embarrassed, but Murphy joins in my glee, and suddenly we're cheering and laughing together. Shit, man, grab that stuff, take it, just go, like, fuck it. Go on then, open it, car. Okay. Dot, 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 dot. Lots of dotting. What are you waiting for? The key? Ah, it doesn't need one? Well, of course it does. Murph, it's a locked treasure chest. Can you not just break the lock? What do you think I am? Houdini? I don't know about that. But I do know you're a very clever scientist whose thirst for knowledge matches my thirst for grog. So you get yours and I'll go get mine. The moggy... The muggy, 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 grin, grins before darting into the next cabin, and I hear a familiar crackling of bottles shortly after. Oh, he's getting his grog, huh? He's getting his drink on. I decide to try and lock, try the lock anyway. While McMurphy is getting his, I look around for something, anything I could lever it with, and I'm disappointed. Everything except the chest and the desk must have been washed away a long time ago. We'll have to come back with some tools to tackle that lock, Murph. There comes no response. Murphy is obviously still busy with his looting and pillaging, so I decide to swim to the beach and get a better look at the wreck from land. When I can take the scene properly, I make out Looks like another large ship is just further down the beach. Wow. I can hardly believe what I'm seeing. One huge vessel finding its way to this land strange enough, but two meeting the same unhappy fate is more than my brain can process. The proximity of the pair would suggest a collision of some kind. Possibly the second vessel could have been a pirate ship. Maybe it was attacking a merchant vessel? I get the feeling I'm looking at the conclusion of a very interesting story here. I wonder why Professor Popper didn't tell me about it. Obviously, he must be aware of the two vessels. My nose for intrigue has started to twitch. I am burning to know more. I decided to take some debris, splinters, and small chunks of metal and pocket it for later analysis in the lab. When I'm satisfied, I've thoroughly com combed the beach for specimens I have salvaged anything of interest, I realize that I haven't seen Murphy for quite a while. Heart stops, my heart stops, and the hairs on my neck stand on end. How could I have been so wrapped up in my work that I neglected to keep an eye on my friend? Big Murphy? I met with silence in still water. I run back towards Kitty's desire, my heart thumping in my chest. Big Murphy! Jump in the sea and swim back to the stream of the ship. There doesn't seem to be any life aboard here. Around here. I break through the surface and choke and try to call out. My throat, of course, full of salt water. Where? Catch the sight of a shadow of the corner of my eye crawling along the seabed. I dive under with a better look and see instantly that it's the Irish cat stalking and prowling as if he were on land. I quickly grab him by the scruff of his neck and drag him back to shore. McMurphy, you loon! What on earth were you playing at? I catch my breath and check him. But he's happily rolling his back in the sand. Me? Having a grand time until you manhandled me with those big meaty paws of yours. I'm gonna let go. Big meaty what? Charming, I must say. I'll have you know that I was very worried about you. And I fully appreciate it. Pause. Murphy has started laughing. It's too infectious not to join in. Seriously though, Mac, 
That was some very impressive breath control. I didn't see you come up for air once. I think I get it from my mother, God bless her. I believe she had fantastic lungs. You remember her? Flashes sometimes, but Carl, when I'm on when I'm on that grog, I have all kinds of flashes, so who knows what, what's real and what isn't. And Fuley's nudging me off that subject, so I respect his privacy. What do you know about these two beauties, then? Survey the ships in silence for a moment or two. I know that they've been a source of great pleasure for me, Kara. Beyond that, I don't really care too much. You really are the embodiment of hedonism. I'll take that as a compliment, Kara. I can't help but laugh. You would. There's worse things in life than a little pleasure. He's got a point. True, but a little balance may, e may be even better. And that's where you come in, huh? You bring some balance to me, Kara. You let me be me. But you can't help but stay safe. Yes, I suppose so. Do you bring some spice to what might otherwise be a rather bland scientist taste. McMurphy green eyed glitter in the sunlight. And he throws me a leak. Come on then, swashbuckler. I need something to eat after all that adventuring. I'll walk you back to camp if you promise to save a bite for your friendly tour guide. As the sun is going down, I decide to retreat into my tent for the night. When I undo the flap, I see McMurphy curled up asleep on my pillow. Bad kitty! McMurphy, you're gonna get fur all over everything. Oh, hi there, Kara. You're back late. You're a you rep scallion. Why are you in my bed? Oh, come on. We both knew I'd get in your bed eventually, didn't we? Oh, he's a perv! I love it. My hand reaches for the spray bottle, but Murphy throws up his paws defensively. I'm an unarmed cat, Kara, and I actually come to give you something for good behavior. Don't make me send it back now. Give me something. What? Ah, sure. Now you're listening. I found something that might just interest you. It's more that grog, Murphy. I can assure you I'm not interested in the slightest sit on the end of my bunk and push him off my pillow to allow him to stay on the bed. As he moves reluctantly aside, I can see a black corner poking out from under my blanket. What's that? Why don't you take a look? I, was, I am skeptically nervous of what he's roping me into now. Tell me first, tell me, what is it first? Ah, will you just pick it up, Kara? I don't know why. It won't bite. I carefully reach for it and realize it's a small leather book. Beautifully aged and yet seems to be in good condition. I open it as gently as I can for fear it might turn into ash in my hands. The first page smudged and faded, but not destroyed uh, by time or water, are the words Captain's Log. <laughs> I can't stop myself from gasping out loud. Oh, Murph, where... Did you find this? There's a lot you can find at the bottom of a bottle or 12. Are you impressed? Impressed? Speechless. I could kiss your furry head. Well, don't let me stand in the way of you and your passion. I hardly noticed he's still speaking as I've begun trying to decipher the entries and I'm instantly engrossed. 1789. Men are getting restless. I begin to fear the continued safe running of this vessel, my vessel which they are in mind of ta uh, to take ownership if Captain Seek served me right. Uh, are you listening? Oh, sorry, what? I said, maybe I should leave you to it then. Oh, yes. No, wait, McMurphy, tell me where you really got this from. Was it the treasure chest? No, Kara. Would you believe it? That thing was full of nothing but sand and still salt water. That bit of treasure, on the other hand, found at the bottom of one of my crates of 
grog hidden in between the bottles. Hmm. But this belongs to a captain. What would it be with the crew's provisions? I'll let you figure that one out, Brainiac. Think of it as a puzzle to keep you amused on all of your cold, lonely nights. Murphy smirks and saunters out of my tent. He's always, they're always giving me things. That's good. Recon 15. Woohoo! Okay, I got one more recon to do, apparently. Diary me rediscover the shipwreck. Okay, let's, let's do it. The book that Murphy gave me is sitting in my lap. I wonder what pirate star, a pirate star is doing on this island. Maybe there'll be some clues within. Well, now we know it's the pirates. I mean, it was obvious, but... The log reads... I felt an almighty crash and then silence and stillness everywhere. everywhere. It took a few seconds to gather my thoughts and understand what had happened here. As if it were really... As if it ever really be possible to understand this godforsaken place. And how we got so far off course to reach here. But, in that moment... Immediately after we hit the rocks, I knew two things was old. I was alive and we were on land. I felt grateful. It felt like a chance at survival. I was determined to grasp it. I felt my legs intact, thank God, and began crawling over the slate and shingle. It seemed to have stretched upwards into eternity. What type of place is this? Darkness was falling fast, but I needed to make sure we would be safe in the unexplored terrain. Who knew what would happen during that long night? What creatures it would bring? Even what strange meteorological anomalies? Looking at the sky, it felt anything was possible, and we ought to be prepared. We had to work fast. I assembled the men, ragtag, tackle, raggle, tackle, raggle, tackle, through though we were into some kind of ordinary unit in the hope that we were famili uh, the familiarity and of discipline would raise morale. We were all tired, cold, and hungry. Some of us needed medical attention. This was not going to be easy, but it's what I was trained for, and I would rather die than let my men down. We need to make some shelter, my voice sounded thin and weak against the sound of the waves crashing. At first light, I looked around and began to take stock properly. It was gratifying to see that the temporary shelter we had cobbled together last night was still intact, and no disaster had befallen us to add to the difficulties we were already burdened with. Considering the conditions we erected this makeshift cover in and how short time, I felt heartened for the first time since we were out at sea, before the strange electrical storm began that ended with us being thrust here against the unforgiving rocks of, the ter of this terrifying place. We could do so much more with daylight on our side and food in our bellies. So they were shipwrecked on the island. The thought of being the first thing I have in here is terrifying. How on earth did they survive? Maybe they didn't. I want to believe that they were rescued, but that seems unlikely. I'll read more this evening. As I put the book away, a small piece of paper falls into my lap. It must have been hidden amongst the pages of the log. It's a note. Maybe a letter? Sally. I know you worry for me, but do not. Men, do not treat me bad. They give me food. Do not beat me so much anymore. The captain is not so fearsome as they say and is giving me lessons on writing. I'm improving. I practice all night because I can't sleep. I work hard sometimes. So my cans crack and bleed, but still use them every morning to pray for you. Aww. That you are safe and well, and that we will be together once again. I miss you so much. The seas have not been smooth. Sometimes the way that we'll, we will capsize completely and be lost out here forever. But I will swim the wildest oceans back to you, my sweet sister. I hope you are practicing your writing too. I would like to read your clever poems again. Your loving brother, Jim. Ah, the first mate. What a sweet letter. I wonder what became of Jim. I wonder if we'll ever find out. Rest. It's in the position Professor Popper taught me. Legs crossed, back straight, resting slightly in knees and fingers, uh, and thumb 
touching gently. Close my eyes and hear rhythmic purring, slow and steady. My fur prickles at the sea breeze. Ears twist uh, and wood and seagulls crying in another faraway place. We're, we're dreaming again. I begin to focus my breathing and rhythm of my heartbeat, allowing my mind to drift. As I take a deep breath in, a tide comes creeping toward me. Wind, one, two, three, four, five. Each beat, I push the tide back in the horizon. Almost it, until it's almost touching the rising sun. Breathe in. Drifting now, without attachment to thought, my mind free from worry or care. I wish it was like that. Are we, can we, can we slept? Alright, do we have any more research? Oh! Uh -huh. Yes, let's do this. It's too early. The world isn't meant to be seen before 7 o'clock. I fucking believe that. These early mornings are still a shock to me, but I'm hitting my stride quicker. I like to get the kittens fed and cleaned out before, bre before my breakfast. But it's easier to do before the rest of the camp is awake, as there are less distractions. I prepare the mush, and my stomach turns at the milky smell so early in the day. I get the swab tray ready and grab a handful of kitty treats. Hello, babies! I peer into the cage and the sleeping kit of the sleeping kittens. So cute. They're just waking up and ready for breakfast. I do a quick head count. Twelve. Good, no one tunneled out in the night. Come on, then let's get you swabbed and fed. Om nom nom. I grab the first sleepy kitten, no more than a than a ball of fluff. And then it opens its mouth to a yawn. I dart, I dart in with a swab bottle, swab, bottle it, and enter the next turbo. You're getting good at this. Oh, hey, Trixie, you're up early. Going to bed late, actually. My story of my life. I keep swabbing, and in no time, I've got all 12 little cats into the feeding cage and have begun cleaning out the sleeping area. Aw, cute. How long will they stay here for? Uh, not sure. Generally, they kept here for about 10 weeks, but then... And then some are released back in the wild immediately. But some are moved to be examined further. I'm still getting the hang of how it all works around here. That's a shame that they aren't all released, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose so. But they'll all be released eventually, just some later than others. You think so? Well, yes, unless they're very poorly, like, ra raven paw. Trixie winces at the mention of the black cat's name. Very few of those kittens actually get released in the wild, man. What do you mean? Of course they do, as long as they're healthy. Oh, wow. And you know this, do you? You release them yourself? Well, no, but Professor Crawford told me that... Kittens get discharged in between 10 to 12 weeks. Oh, I see. Trixie smiles, but it looks fake. If I were you, I'd tag one of the slippers. Oh no, they're too young to be tagged. You have to wait till they're at least 12 weeks. That one over there looks like he's healthy. I'm sure if you tagged him, you'd be able to see, him, see for yourself what happens to the healthy kittens. Is I gonna answer? I hear breakfast there. I hear the breakfast bell in the distance. Oh, Cinderella has to fly. And the calico cat is gone as quickly as she appeared. Come on then, kitties. Let's get you back into your nice, clean cage. I'm gonna tag it. I can't help but think about what Trixie said. She seems generally concerned, and there must be some basis for that. After all, she's been here a lot longer than me. Maybe tag one of these kittens wouldn't be such a bad idea. What would be the harm? Let's do it. We're tagging a kitty. Come on then. Back to you. Before I even finish my sentence, my hand grabbed the, the chipping pin and I tagged the plump gray male. Probably silly, but I won't harm it won't harm you. And it can teach me something useful.
look at that star and now take yourself a thousand miles beyond it and tell me what you see. I laugh at Big Murphy passes me the bottle I swig before applying. Damn. These two are like drinking buddies. Murphy, what are you talking about? Just do it, Carl. That big shiny one way up there. Got a thousand miles go a thousand miles beyond. Tell me where you can you get to. I smile. Parting on Venus. Oh yeah. There's so many goddesses here. Murphy, they're all naked. You should see this. The laughing stops, or maybe it was only in my head to begin with. I look down at the fluffy cat who seems to be far from his usual self. You okay, kitty cat? I think there's a big pub up in the sky. Murphy grins and closes his eyes. And there I am, my big human toes warming by the fireplace. And my long hair is in the same dark golden color as, I, as the ill I have in my man hand. They're singing lots of it, and people dancing around. Those that can't find space to dance on the floor, dance on the tables, naturally. Sounds about right. There's an old sky pirate in the corner telling stories to anyone who will listen. The time he sailed Jupiter or Mars, and you were there too, of course. You're sat right next to me. We've unlimited drinks because we're famous in these parts. We're practically royalty. Ale, stout, beer, whiskey too. We all just keep coming. When it gets dark and the place is quiet, we sneak out back to the beer garden. There's a clear view of Earth from where we were sitting. We don't miss it. Murphy spits. Talk about our adventures, about how we sailed off this damn island, and how the ship became airborne. We talk about how we fought the big breasted, bloodthirsty alien winches of em the Emerald Star, and how we had to charm our way out of the space slug's lair. And I reckon we'd have a lot of fun. Man, this this cat has a, a good imagination. I like it. Of course, you wouldn't be able to keep your paws off me. Begging for a kiss, and I'd be saying, Now, nah, Kara, I'm not a piece of meat, you know? And then you'd be saying, Oh, McMurphy, please, just one of your world famous kisses. The fancy French kind. And I'd be saying, Please, Kara, control yourself. I start snickering again. What are you laughing at? You! You trying to say you wouldn't be all over me if I was human? Of course I wouldn't. Ouch, now that don't be mean. You'd be the one begging me for a kiss. What on, what on earth gives you that idea? Top of the morning, Kara. I love you so much. To be sure, give me a smacker. That is so offensive. Stop laughing. I went a little too far there, I'm sorry. I feel it's out of weary smile. Or wry smile. Well, maybe I would try to steal a kiss. Who can blame me? You wouldn't get one. The very smile disappears. You know something, Carl? Huh. I think I should just come out and say it. Say what? I hope this one, I hope this, this, this person I'm playing doesn't die. Because this is good. You're all right. There's a pause, not an uncomfortable pause, just a slightly confusing one. You're all right too. Murphy's gazing at the stars. I don't know what I'm doing. It's a strange feeling. I'm used to being a step ahead of everyone. Well, two steps ahead of you. Hey, don't be rude, Murph. I laugh. McMurphy grins. This feeling isn't new to me, but I'm still not sure what it is. All I know is that you get me in a way no one has before, and I get you too. Even if you don't care to admit, I guess it's time to let the cat out of the bag. Meow. Without thinking, I look around. I'm so used to bagging and unbagging cats for my work that I take him literally. It isn't it, 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 but his expression stops me from reacting. I've become attached in the last few weeks. You've captured my heart, and I, I don't want to be without you, Car. We're going to, we're gonna, we're gonna romance this kitty. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. I haven't had so much fun, felt so free, or begin 
or been so happy as the time I've spent with you. I don't think I'd care to be without you either. You have my heart. Why surprise me, Murphy looks visibly moody. Well, Kara, I look forward to many more adventures with you. We got me, Murphy! Alright, we're gonna do one last research. I'm ready. I hope that we don't die. Like, I really do. Okay, Professor Popper says we'll be testing some of the new mess instead. Just to... okay. I'm in the lab a little later than usual today. I got held up by an incredibly important task of petting all the cats I saw on the way in. <clears throat> really crucial stuff. As I enter, I see a large, unmarked wooden box on the table. Good morning, Professor. I wasn't expecting you were working us, uh, alongside me today. I'm not. I'm afraid I'm actually rather in a hurry, but I needed to explain to you the new protocol I'd like you to carry out for me. He opens a lid of a crate, and inside are rows of small, clear bottles, each containing white fluid. What's this? Milk? No, these are samples from our offshore lab. Samples of what? So many questions. Curiosity is a marvelous trait for a scientist. Now I want you to run some tests on these, and I want you to check how they respond to contact with compounds 16, 18, and 24. I notice how daftly evaded my question. Once you've done that, provided there are no complications, I'll need you to apply a sample to some of the cats and record the results. I beg your pardon? Apply the sample to the cats, Marine looking for specific reactions. Of course, sir, but on I have a little more information before I start applying an untested product to a living subject? Look, Maureen, I understand your concerns. Of course I do. However, once in a while, one has to trim the red tape. And this one, this is one of those occasions. Now, I re really am in the most awful rush, my dear. But I have, to compl I have complete faith in you. I am suddenly alone. I pick up one of the samples in the box and it looks like a miniature milk bottle. But the fluid inside is creamier than milk. I retrieved the compounds from the cabinet. And the professor wanted me to test and spend some time combining them with a sample. From what I can tell, the compounds are some kind of organic material, but no one has told me where they come from or what they actually are. I look at them under the microscope one by one and add a little bit of the sample. It's a bit like glue, so it's hard to get it to combine. But once I do something on it, so the dead cells that make up the, com the compounds start to actually no, start to move excitedly. They aren't coming back to life exactly, but what are they behaving? But they are behaving like living cells. Are we making zombies? I have no idea what this stuff is or its intended use, but I do know that I feel uncomfortable applying it to live subjects. I look at the certain cats in the cages, and they look back at me with trusting eyes. Oh. Um. Eh. Uh, eh. Uh, I'm gonna administer it. I suppose I have no choice. Professor will fire me if I don't do the job I was hired to do. I try to stay professional and detached. I've won the crates and retrieved Muffin, a slightly plump Persian. She starts purring as soon as I touch her. She's a little older than the other cats and loves the attention. I hope this stuff doesn't harm her. I set her down on the counter, get a little of the sample, and apply it gently to her legs. She seems a bit put out, but she's still purring. That's a good sign. Wait about 20 minutes and nothing has happened. Hopefully another good sign. I apply a little more to the back of her neck this time. I feel really uncomfortable doing this without any recommended, recommended dosage or guidelines. Flying blind goes against all of my training to date, but I have to, I have to have faith that the professor knows what he's doing. This is his project after all. After another 20 minutes, I don't notice anything physical, although Muffin does seem to be a little more energetic than usual. She's happily chasing my pen across the counter. I wrestle the pen 
out of her grip and make some notes of my observations and place her gently back in the crate. I decided to spend the night in the lab. I don't want to leave her alone. Just in case anything happens by 4 a.m., Muffin's sleeping soundly, and I can't keep my eyes open any longer, so I head back to my tent. I've come to the forest to gather my thoughts. This morning I noticed another change in my appearance. Up until now, it's been easy to cover my transition. Uh, okay, we, we've read this one. I'm stubbed the tail. Yeah, yep, we've done that. A new element point, and I'm explaining the fact that my pupils have vertical slits. I can't risk anyone seeing me, so I... It's a beautiful night, and Murphy and I are laying on the sand by the shipwrecks, relaxed in the way that only cats can be. I remember back to anxiety and stress I used to live with. Oh, we get to live. Good. For any antidote research, it makes my fur stand up. I thought our lives depended upon me. It was my love for McMurphy that finally got me to see sense. Why was I so desperate to make him the same as me? Hadn't I fallen for him the, the way he was? So I decided to turn it on its head and become like him. Meow meow. Huh, Marine. I lose track after 30. We're lying out under the stars. Yeah, I can't help smiling to myself. But I remember how cold I used to think it was at night. Mac used to rig me for whining. Now here I am. As snug as, as snug as can be, counting the stars with a cat I love more than anything else in the world. You see? The trouble is, Kara, you're still thinking like a scientist. What do you mean? So when you count the stars, you begin at one and assume there's going to you're going to keep chanting numbers until you've qual quantified the whole entire galaxy. He laughs until his eyes twinkle with moisture. Oh yeah? Go on then, Murph the, Murph the Wise, and light me on the better ways of counting. So if you ask me how many stars there are, I take an overall squint at the sky, judge how clearly or cloudy or clear it is, and decide that there's enough, if there's enough light to hunt, not too much in, is the right amount for that, by the way. Or too little for this for a snooze. Best when it's bright, or just enough to steal a kiss from your from your sweetheart. Oh, that's cute. And judging by this guy tonight, he nuzzles into my fur. And I'm the happiest cat in the universe. Meow. Yay! We got love drunk. <laughs> 